This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Hi there, and welcome to the Science of Magic, a program combining the science and magic of today's leading topics to co-create new solutions. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring energy medicine. Shamanism is an ancient form of energy medicine, whereby the practitioner manages frequency at the quantum level to restore balance and health. More modern practices also employ energy medicine as working with non-polarized scalar energy at the quantum level. Theoretically, through the use of parity particles present at the scalar energy level, a practitioner can channel the equal but opposite of any imbalance or pathogen and cancel it out. Another modern form, known as homeopathy, uses the law of similar, rather than parity or, or equal but opposite, to restore balance. As frequency masters, shaman also use this approach. To understand the principle, we need to look no further than the garden variety piano. Most single tones on the piano are produced by more than one string. In order to get a pure balanced tone, the tuner aligns the multiple strings of one note closely enough that any inherent dissonance is canceled out. In just this way, similar, sim similar frequencies are used in energy medicine to cancel out any frequency imbalances causing disease. Our guest this hour has first-hand experience with and some interesting thoughts on the healing powers of energy medicine. With us is Amy Lansky, who was a NASA researcher in artificial intelligence when her life was transformed by the miraculous homeopathic cure of her son's autism. She's the author of Impossible Cure, The Promise of Homeopathy, now one of the best-selling introductory books on homeopathy worldwide. Since then, Amy has broadened her investigations to include ancient and modern teachings about consciousness, synchronicity, meditation, and our collective power to evolve and transform the world resulting in her second book, Active Consciousness, The Awakening Power Within. Amy's writing has appeared on a variety of media venues. She's also featured in the recent movie, Time is Art. Her website, amylansky.com. Amy, thanks for joining us on The Science of Magic. Thanks for having me, Gwilta. It's fun to be here. <laughs> it's interesting that you read a book on homeopathy, but you're not a, a homeopathic physician. How'd that, how'd that come about? Well, um... Actually, I did practice for a couple of years, but uh, what happened was, as you, as you mentioned, uh, my son was healed of autism with homeopathy, and that spurred me to study homeopathy myself. So I did study for several years. I studied to be a practitioner, um, and I also I decided to write this book because I felt this information is pretty unknown, uh, especially in the United States. It's more well-known in Europe and especially in India. 
but I decided I just had to let people know about it. Um, and I did. I wrote this book, and it became immediately popular. It was, it was pretty amazing. And uh, I, then I did practice part-time for a couple of years, but I realized I'm more of a researcher, not a practitioner, and that uh, my role uh, in this is really more to uh, write and educate people. But um, people do write to me from all over the world. Every day I'm always answering emails and sort of hand-holding, especially a lot of parents uh, with autistic children who are trying homeopathy. So outside of the, your training in homeopathy, do you have any other medical training? Well, outside of mothering being one long internship <laughs> <with> paramedics. <laughs> no formal medical training. I mean, I did uh, as part of my homeopathy training, we had to take anatomy and physiology too. Uh, but... Uh, uh, no. So, no. <laughs> we have just a little time in this segment. How did you learn about homeopathy? Well, um, actually, it was one of those synchronistic type of events. You know, I was, um, we were dealing with my son's issues. He was about, he was just over three at the time, three and a half. And I was reading Mothering Magazine, which at the time was a much more uh, alternative magazine. It's become more mainstream. We're going to have to uh, pick up with this on the other side of the break. Amy and I I will return shortly, so don't go away. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Our current episodes are aired daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. In service to our listeners, prior innovative episodes can always be accessed free of charge on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. The Science of Magic is produced by Relmar McConnell Media Company out of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. President of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Hello, I'm Pete Marsh. With my daughter Justina, we will be presenting the new radio show, Too Good to Be True. If something seems too good to be true, it usually is. But with the help of Justina's amazing gifts, we're going to gain insight into questions that don't yet have complete answers. Have you wondered who built Stonehenge and for what reason? 
wire crop circles found in the same region as Stonehenge and elsewhere? Are crop circles a hoax or are they created with technologies that we have little knowledge of? Who built the pyramids in Egypt and also in other countries? How and why were they built? Was the Titanic switched with the Britannic as part of a gigantic insurance fraud or for more insidious reasons? What caused the Tunguska event when trees were flattened over an 800 square mile area in Siberia? Will the new insights be too good to be true? Well, that will depend on what you are prepared to believe. Please join us as we start on this journey together. For more information on Too Good To Be True, visit www.xzbn.net. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is author of Impossible Cure, The Promise of Homeopathy, Amy Lansky. Her website, amylansky.com. Amy, we were just talking about your son and how he got you into homeopathy. Would you mind continuing? Yes, yes. So I was just briefly, uh, I read an article in Mothering Magazine about homeopathy, just a short one, and I just just somehow knew this might be our answer. And uh, we found a new uh, homeopath that was new to the area, and we were very lucky because now I know how hard it is to treat autism. And but he found the correct remedy immediately, and within like just days, uh, we didn't tell our therapist what we had done, but she could see we we could see this subtle but noticeable change in him. And um, so it was a process. It was you know, but within a couple years of treatment, he was testing above age level. By the time he was uh, five. He was, he was, you know, he had still had some issues, but not noticeably to most people at that point. And by the time he was around nine, he was completely free. That's amazing. It is what, amazing. Uh, when did you notice that he was autistic? Was there something leading up to it? Well, um, his case, you see, he was in the, the early cohort of autistic children. So he was born in 1991, and that was actually... Uh, the first year that the hepatitis B vaccine was given at birth. We didn't even know he had gotten it. We only discovered that a few, a few years ago. He's now 25. But um, he, um, so he was in a cohort where the autism epidemic began. But we didn't really notice anything till he was, I would say, around two. He had, he had, he, he was losing eye contact, and he was just going off into his own world. He became in this dreamy state, which is one of the profiles. There's many different kind of varieties of autism, autistic kid behavior. But he was just living in his own world, and by the time he was uh, like two and a half, the nursery school he was attending said that we had to seek medical attention. So it was just becoming more and more obvious something was wrong. And I have an older son as well, so I knew what... Um, I, he wasn't my first child. I knew what sort of typical development was like. So uh, when did you have him diagnosed by professionals? So um, at around, let's see, at three, at just after he was three, we, we started seeing a, a therapist who deals with kids in this area. And... Uh, so, uh, and he was put into like a, a, a joint session with another kid who was autistic. 
And the other kid was more verbal than, than Max. That's my, that's my son. And, uh, but his behavior was much more erratic, which is another parent. Max was in this sort of withdrawn, dreamy state. Uh, so we were doing this biweekly therapy. It was sort of a speech and language therapy. And don't forget, did, this was early on, and there weren't these right, other but therapies. Did, right, but did, did you have a medical professional, like a doctor, diagnose him as well as a therapist? Yeah, well, I must say that after the fact, after he started doing better, when he, we took him to the pediatrician, she said, I can't believe what's happened to him. He was autistic. Um, but at the time, you know, doctors weren't as readily uh, diagnosing children. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't forget, this was 1994. This was very right. early on. Um, so what, so is home, what is homeopathy exactly? So homeopathy um, is, a, like you said, it's a more modern form of alternative medicine, although it's 200, over 200 years old. And it was developed by uh, Samuel Hahnemann in Germany, who was a, a, a medical doctor and scientist at the time, in the early 1800s. And he knew about um, Hippocrates' principle that cure could be um, achieved through similars or opposites. So he, uh, he experimented with this, and he found that this law of similars worked. He, he experimented at the time with giving substances that can cause the symptoms that a patient has. So that's the definition of homeopathy. Homeo means similar. Pathy means suffering. So homeopathy defines precisely what medicine is given to a patient. The homeopath uh, usually just talks to the patient, finds out all their symptoms, physical, mental, behavioral, emotional, and then tries to find a medicine that matches, th that can produce those symptoms. Um, initially, when Hahnemann was giving, using this approach, he was using, you know, m very material doses of substances. Um, one of his earliest papers was about uh, the use of belladonna in a, in a scarlet fever epidemic, and he met with great success with that. But over time, he realized that these were toxic levels of the substances, so he also started diluting them because he was also a chemist. And he not only diluted them, but he inc incorporated vigorous shaking into the process, which he, call which he called succussion. And then he found that, amazingly, that even though it was diluted beyond what he realized could be like material doses, it was working and working even better. So um, just to give another example of the law of similars, uh, I usually use the, the example of the remedy made from coffee. We all know what coffee does to us. It, it makes us alert and happy and excited and also can cause um, physical symptoms like heart palpitations or diarrhea. So if you're experiencing, for example, insomnia that matches that profile, not just any insomnia, but let's say the type of insomnia after a, a party and you're excited, your mind's all full of thoughts, and your heart's racing, then the remedy made from coffee, now not actual coffee, but this highly diluted and shaken, um, which homeopaths call potentized coffee, might cure your insomnia. But if right. your insomnia pattern is different, let's say you're worrying and you're anxious about work and you're waking up early in the morning, um, then that might be a different pattern of insomnia, and then a different remedy would be more appropriate for you. So I understand that homeopathic physicians or, or homeopathic practitioners can't prescribe medicine per se. Um, how, do, how do you, where is that line drawn? How is that figured out? Well, you know, of course, some, some homeopaths are physicians. Um, so they can do whatever they want. You know, they can use both in their practice. But in the United States, anyway, um, um, or, or in, and in Canada, actually in Europe, there's more MD homeopaths. But um, in the United States, homeopaths aren't, uh, obviously they're not licensed physicians, so they can't prescribe or make comments. Um, in fact, there's a whole movement called the Health Freedom Movement in the United States. You know, medicine is regulated state by state in the United States. And I was involved in that as well, passing a law here in California that enables alternative unlicensed practitioners to practice 
as long as they don't do certain things. They can't say they're a doctor. They can't prescribe or comment on prescriptions made by doctors. Um, and they have to reveal their training. And they, it's more like they can't do anything harmful, and, and they have to disclose what they're, what, who they are and what their training is. Right. And isn't isn't the, medicine in the United States regulated by the FDA, though? No, no. Uh, the FDA regulates the the remedies, the medicines. It doesn't regulate practitioners. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so the I practitioners understand. are regulated by the state. I, I, yeah, the state boards. That makes sense. Yeah. I understand there's quite a bit of bad blood between the American Medical Association and the homeopathic physicians. What do you know about that? Well, I mean, there's a long history of this. Um, homeopathy, as I mentioned, really took off in the early 1800s and spread all over the world in the mid-1800s. And um, it came to the United States around in the 1840s when a lot of German immigrants were coming. Because a lot of and they were all doctors. So in the early days, in the 1800s, homeopathic homeopaths were all doctors, and what hap- And they started their own medical schools, um, and many prominent medical schools in the United States began as homeopathic medical schools. This includes um, the Hahnemann School in Philadelphia, Hahnemann, Hahnemann Medical School. So. Um, and what, the, what was happening, they were being more successful, especially in treating chronic disease and epidemics than conventional allopathic doctors. And the allopaths didn't like that. At the time, the AMA was just being formed, and they made it part of their preamble of their charter that no doctor could associate with a homeopath, um, a homeopathic doctor. And... There was all kinds of bad blood because even at the time, presidents and, you know, famous people were using homeopathy. There would be husband and wife doctors where the wife was a homeopathic MD and the, the husband was a, ma- a man. And, Which can't associate with each other. And the, right. And the, and the man would be censured and removed from the homeopathic society because of his association with his wife. Wow. So there were all kinds of incidents like this. Very famous people. I mean, there were a homeopathic medical corps still operating in World War I. Um, so it was really the rise of the me- pharmaceutical industry that destroyed um, homeopathy in the United States, and, as well as chiropractic, uh, um, you know, and other alternative, what was called eclectic medicine at the time. It's similar to naturopathic medicine. And it's only in, like, the 1970s that there was a rise of all these alternative practices again. So is, is there any um, studies available now that kind of redeem homeopathy as a viable medical practice? Well, there's tons. I mean, you know, just like a, lo- a lot of misinformation that we hear, that, you know, it's sort of the mantra in the, in the press or among doctors, who, are, who really don't know anything about homeopathy. Because, in fact, most of the time, homeopathy is confused or used as a synonym with natural medicine, but it's a very specific form of natural medicine. In any case, um, they always say, oh, there's no studies, it's not proven, and that's just completely false. There's more studies every year, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. In the United States as well, but mostly in Europe and India, where homeopathy is is you know, sanctioned, very big medicine, especially in India. So uh, if you just search around online, I mean, there's just, you might go to the website of the National Center for Homeopathy, which is uh, nationalcenterforhomeopathy.org. I mean, there's just links to, there's literally hundreds of studies and more being done every day. And recently, even laboratory studies. So studies done on um, even on, like on rats or even in vitro studies done on cells, like, for example, cancer cells, um, done at, at famous cancer institutes are being done now, where they use um, highly dilute homeopathic remedies and noticing um, them changing uh, cancer cells. Um, there was even one just done this past year. Every, a lot of people know about Arnica, the use of Arnica for healing wounds, and they found that um, Arnica actually um, affected cells in the laboratory that enabled healing. 
Amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. So um, we're going to have to take a, a quick break here. On the other side, uh, you've been doing some interesting re- work around consciousness that I'd like to address. So when okay. we get back, we will become more conscious. How's that? Okay, great. <laughs> Amy and I will return to our discussion on the other side of this break, so don't go away. We're coming to you through the Exxon Broadcast Network. Don't miss the other fine shows and hosts on xzbn.net. You're listening to The Science of Magic, your resource for creative solutions in a changing world, thescienceofmagic.net. are our personal gateways into infinite wisdom. Don't miss Shamanic Counselor and Indigenously Trained Dream Decoder Sandra Corcoran's inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles Sandra's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers and her initiations throughout the Americas and across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt. Sandy's knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth influenced her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private tarot readings, international journeys, a meditative CD, as well as her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate this earthwalk, creating a deeper connection to yourself and all that is. Find this and more at Sandy's website, starwalkervisions.com. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Hello, I'm Justina Marsh, and with my dad, Pete, we are going to present a new show called Too Good to Be True. Together, we are aiming to discover more truths about this world and beyond. Do you have unanswered questions about the world? Do you ever wonder about aliens, conspiracy theories, or the universe? There are many shows discussing subjects such as pyramids or UFOs, but we want to relay this information based on our own research, including from spiritual means. Hopefully, listeners will be helped with their own beliefs and will appreciate the psychic insights that add to the previous research and information. We both look forward to sharing this insight and beginning this journey with our listeners. Visit xzbn.net for more information about when to listen.
Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to mo- promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is author of Active Consciousness, Awakening the Power Within, Amy Lansky. Her website, amylansky.com. Amy, you like we were saying, you've also done some pretty interesting work around consciousness. How much influence did your background in artificial intelligence have on your interest in working with consciousness? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting question because uh, most people who are, who work in that area don't have ideas like mine uh, about consciousness. Um, you know, uh, and that, in fact, they're trying to, you know, underlying everything, create machines that that are like humans, right? Or or to blend machines with humans. And I always felt that that machines are are tools. They're 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 not conscious beings, although perhaps someday we'll create a robot or something that gets that a consciousness decides to attach to. I guess that's possible. But um, so um, so I don't know. I I, it's, I just that's just my orientation. I, you know, I don't think of a machine as any more conscious than a toaster or a car. Um, uh, does that answer your question? I just but, um, wondered, you know, how much, how much your, uh, again, your, your uh, association or work with artificial intelligence had to do with you being drawn to looking at more organic intelligence, more organic consciousness. Yeah. I don't think it had anything to do with it, to say the truth, <laughs> okay. um, except that um, I, I, I felt that I didn't agree with a prevailing viewpoint among my colleagues. Um, but I, you know, I, I had contact with a lot of, just by chance, this is again sort of synchronistic, with uh, researchers on psychic phenomena um, that were being done at the research institute I was working at. It was called SRI, the Stanford Research Institute. And um, Russell Targ was working there, and I actually knew his daughter because we went to Stanford together. She was in medical school. We we knew each other, and she also did research with him. And I just always thought there was something to it. And I was also a mathematician, and um, I was drawn during that period to to writings about the fourth dimension, the fourth spatial dimension, and that actually was what sparked my interest in this. This was before homeopathy. Um, I read, um, and then I saw, actually, believe it or not, a Star Trek episode about aliens in the fourth dimension. I just remember staying up all night one night thinking, what would it mean to be four-dimensional? And, uh, and then this stuff with homeopathy and my son happened and alternative medicine, it all just blended together. And I thought about, I came up with this idea how, um, how we are three-dimensional beings but we're moving through time and creating uh, reality in a larger space, a four-dimensional space. And um, so, so, does this that, does this bring us to your do you, do you where you refer to a field of consciousness? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I believe that the field of consciousness is that each of us we have a three-dimensional physical body, but that we have layers of energy bodies uh, built, sort of interpenetrating and built on top of that, and that chi, which is what's called chi, or the vital force in homeopathy, is just the first layer. And so alternative medicines like homeopathy and acupuncture and all the rest are, I think, mostly working on this chi, which is the closest to the physical body and regulates it. But the higher energy bodies, which esoteric traditions believe continue with you after you die, um, are possibly, this is what I surmise in my book, uh, operate in these higher dimensions, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and maybe higher. Maybe there's infinite dimensions. I don't know. But, um, and that because of that, they have access to information about the future, about the past, um, uh, and the ability to change our trajectory through three dimensions, etc. So, so in this paper, I, I discussed this. It was a short paper, but it became the basis for my second book, which I wrote many years later, because people started, I put it on the Internet way back in 1995, 96, and um, 
people started writing to me, and I figured, okay, I, I should write a book about this. And in that book, I sort of relay all these things together. Mm. Um, you know, um, um, you mentioned Russell. Uh, wasn't he um, studying remote viewing? Yes, yes. So that, yes, and, he, that, that and, was what he was doing at SRI. Mm -hmm. and, and doesn't remote viewing have to do with being able to project yourself across time and space? That's right. So that, one, that right there, the fact that remote viewing is possible uh, indicates there's a part of us that can transcend time and space. And, you know, I'm going to surmise that it's a four-dimensional part of us because if we, were four, if we had a four-dimensional capability, we would have those abilities. Um, to understand that, just think about the difference between two dimensions and three dimensions. So, like, a two-dimensional thing is like a piece of paper. And if you were a two-dimensional being on a piece of paper, if you actually had access to the third dimensions, you could sort of pop off the paper and look around and see other things far away and, and move and stuff. Just so the same way, if, since we are three dimensions, we can't just do that in our physical bodies. But if there's a four-dimensional part of us, the astral body, for example, then we could look beyond time and space into other locations. And that's exactly what remote viewers do. So... That takes us back to the field of consciousness. We're traveling through the yes. field of consciousness to do that? Well, we are part of the field of consciousness. Um, so we are higher We are beings who have three-dimensional but also higher-dimensional bodies attached to us, and we are part of this larger field of consciousness that, cause, and we are higher, and that's higher-dimensional, that we are higher dimensional, and then we can interact with each other through, in, through this field. So that's why, even though we may not be, you know, consciously aware of it a lot of the time, um, we can have, like, simultaneous communications with people who are, you know, across the globe or in the future or have premonitions of the future or create healing in our bodies that's highly improbable um it is through this higher dimensional aspect of ourselves through which and we're all interconnected and part of that um so another thing oh you, you state it's yeah. it's already accepted by physicists that this at the subatomic level everything is a set of probabilities or potentialities that affect that are affected by our awareness OK, yes. that being the case, how much influence can we have or power o to overcome um, what might be about to take place? Do we have any power there? Well, I think we do. This is one of the reasons I wrote my book. I think that uh, more and more people are becoming aware of this um, and that a lot of it just involves uh, self-development. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a superhuman being because I'm just, you know, have my own foibles. Um, but all the work on manifestation um, that's going on really is trying to tap into um, this ability. And some people are better at it than others. Some people are able to, um, let's say, have, can, can you know, um, Oh, I, I might mention the work of Florence Scovel Shin. I'm not sure you've heard of her. She was uh, a metaphysician of the early 1920s, and this is what she precisely did. She used, she called it the power of the word to affect how the future unfolded, and she using these sort of spoken affirmations. You talked about shamanism. Shamans are actually able to, are highly adept at using their higher energy bodies to intuit information, but also to affect uh, what's going on in this in these higher dimensional energy fields. Um, so they're sometimes called these aspects of yourself: the astral body, the mental body, the causal body. So, so if we're talking about the if we're talking about this field of consciousness, do we actually yeah. create this field through our consciousness or in our conscious intent, or does it already exist and we simply work through it? The latter. So it's all around us. This is my belief, and and this and and we are part of it, and we work through it, and we have access to it too through our our 
element of it. So we're like a drop in this giant ocean, but we're part of that ocean, and we can interact with all the other drops in the ocean. Um, so do our beliefs so, and intents affect our collective reality through a field of consciousness? They do. And in fact, uh, well, here's an example. This is an, a scientific experimental result with another, through my strange... Uh, my husband actually did some work with somebody named Dean Radin. Maybe you've heard of him. He's another famous researcher of psychic phenomena. And what they've done is they've hooked up um, these random event generators, so truly random machines that normally will be completely random. And what they try to do is figure out if there's something going on, let's say, on the planet that everybody is affected by, Will these machines, you know, be affected and veer off from randomness? And they, they ran these machines. There were about 50 machines located all over the world. And they ran them for several years. And they found that the machine's behavior was affected by collective global events, especially bad ones. And the biggest, the biggest, uh, veering away from randomness that occurred was just before 9-11. Mm-hmm. Like about an hour before 9-11, uh, it began to be affected. So that, that showed that not only were, was our collective consciousness affecting a physical machine, the behavior of a physical machine, but it actually was precognitive of the event. So it, this, this change began just before 9-11 occurred. Um, So before we were, and in fact, Dean has done other studies that show um, also that measured people's reaction, let's say, to um, very disturbing pictures and sounds. So he would randomly show people pictures of like disturbing things or calm things. And then he had people hooked up and obviously they reacted to the disturbing things and the calm things the way you'd think. But the interesting part was that their reaction occurred measurably just before they were shown the picture. Yes, I remember that. I remember that study. I was uh, talking to a gentleman not too long ago that predicts events now based on social media and that sort of thing. Ah, (laughs) Well, it turns out my husband did the computer work for Dean for that study. How fun is that? And so... (laughs) And so... And he remembers that Dean was like, it had, it had to be meticulous because you had to be sure that the recording, what they recorded about people's reactions did indeed occur before the, you know, the, they saw the image. Um, so, I mean, these, these people who do this kind of research, who all have PhDs, by the way, Dean from Princeton. Uh, We're going to have to take know, it. We're going to have to take another commercial break. Yeah. And Amy okay. and I Amy and I will be back shortly, so don't leave us now. This is the Science of Magic, your resource to altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric working to create common ground for the betterment of our world. Join our email family to receive our amazing topic-driven episodes at thescienceofmagic.net. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. 
This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. What's up in your world? Email me at info at thescienceofmagic.net and suggest a topic that's on your mind. You're probably not the only one interested. Again, our guest this hour is Amy Lansky. Her website, amylansky.com. Amy, we were talking about the field of consciousness. How does... um, uh, homeopathy um, affect the field of consciousness, and how does it being, um, you know, the uh, closely related versus uh, curing by opposites? How does that work in the field of consciousness? Well, um, I believe that uh, homeopathy is mostly affecting the etheric body, which is, like I said, the first layer above the physical body, and which controls for the most part, uh, how our physical body operates. Uh, So it is um, really the fundamental underlying structure of our physical body. Um, This is why taking, let's say, allopathic drugs, which mostly work, like you say, through the the opposites, uh, is sort of forcing the body 
to, to operate in a certain way. So we take antihistamines to suppress inflammation. Um, um, but at the level of the energy body, the, the operation of the law of similars um, is actually very effective, perhaps more effective than the law of opposites. This is what homeopaths believe. Uh, actually, the law of the similars also works on the physical level. So, for example, if you put your hand into a bucket of warm water, it will actually become cold after. And so, homeopaths will say, if you burn your hand, you should put your buck, you should put your, run your hand under warm water, as warm as you can tolerate, not cold water. Um, and you'll find that this actually works. If you burn your hand, and cooks know this, if they burn their hand, they put their hand close to the flame and it will actually cool their hand, and, the, and you won't get a bad burn. So, um, so it works on the physical so basically level. So basically it's like your body is responding um, to the very same thing it's being hit with to find balance. Yeah, so the home, um, homeopaths have like about four different theories about why this works. And one of them is, like I said, action, counteraction. This is what you just said. So um, if you... You know, for every action, there's an opposite reaction. So if you, um, let's say your body is stuck in position A, if you just keep pushing it to the opposite position, uh, B, then it will keep trying to push back to A. But if you push it towards A, it might swing back towards B, the opposite position. So, so that's what uh, body workers call pushing you into your pattern. Yeah. Rather than trying to correct right. the imbalance, you push into the imbalance, and then the body does the correcting. Right. So that's one theory. Another theory is the one you mentioned at the beginning of the show where you talked about resonance, like the violin strings. So another theory is that by matching your vibration, you actually strengthen the, the, the general vibration of the body, and then that strengthens you to heal yourself. So that's a second theory. A third theory is that um, what has been called replacement uh, which is that you are giving, and it's close to the ideas behind um, chaos theory, um, where your body is stuck in, let's say, a certain physical, a, a certain energetic pattern that it can't get out of sickness, right? So mm -hmm. you give it a very similar thing, but not the same thing. You're giving it an energy that's very similar, and that enables it to, uh, it's like a piece of information that enables it to, let's say, replace its state with this new state, this fake disease that's in the remedy, in, in essence. And then, then the body can let go of its stuckness, and then is that, the is remedy that the principle fades. That, is that the principle that immunizations come from? No, um, I, let me think. <laughs> immunization. <laughs> Uh, I would, in, in immunizations, we're treating yeah. with a, with a disease. That's right. Uh, immunizations are based on you know building up antibodies to a specific antigen, right? Um, so it sounds um, like this is an energetic antigen, antibodies yeah, antigens. Yeah. Yeah, you, you could say that, yeah, because, of course, homeopaths view most vaccinations as toxic. Um, but, uh, yes, and it is, it is sort of the same principle. Um, you know, it's also why, for example, you know, why do you give kids Ritalin who, are, who are, um, have ADD? You're giving them speed, essentially. It's oper it works. It's at a toxic level, but you're, it works because of the law of similars. You're giving a kid who's super speedy. Uh, uh, something that makes them speedy and it slows them down in reaction. I, I would say it's more action counteraction, uh, reaction counteraction of the body. And there's one more theory about uh, how this works, which is a more spiritual one uh, that you're, that the body is sort of mm, has forgotten how to heal, it's just forgotten what's going on. It's like stuck in this in a state, and you're giving this information. Uh, to the body that says, ah, okay, I, I didn't, I forgot I was stuck, that I'm reacting strangely. Now I can see what, what the problem really is, and then it can react to it. 
How so, much do you th- um, how much do you think our belief systems, our judgments, our patterns has to do with getting our bodies stuck in a particular dysfunctional pattern? I think it has everything to do with it. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of writing a third book about this subject, about how we can actually cure ourselves fundamentally, because most illness or problems of all kinds is originates in our own thoughts, in our own pattern, and that if we really had better control, um, or I wouldn't say control, but awareness of what we're doing, that most illnesses would go away. Not that, I mean, obviously, if you have a car accident and your legs are broken, you're going to need some help and go to the hospital and have your legs set. But in general, most chronic problems, or a lot of them, are a result of our state of being that we do have control over. So how can we intentionally and consistently use this field of consciousness to manifest the life we want rather than the car accident or rather than illness? Well, it's, you know, it's very hard because a lot of us are stuck in our monkey mind um, and and in the pattern that we're habituated to. And so I would say the first step is to learn to meditate and be aware of what we're doing. And so um, in my second book, I talk, I have a lot of uh, information about how to meditate, about personal awareness, how to, how to start taking control. And it's not easy. It's not easy for me either. Um, I talk about all the teachings of masters uh, like Gurdjieff and Steiner. And it, a lot of it begins with meditation. So I would say to your listeners, begin by learning to meditate and um, what, using whatever tradition you're interested in. It um, doesn't have to be even a fixed tradition. You could look at the meditation exercises in my book and begin with that. So um, are, you, are you still working for NASA, Amy? Oh, no, no. I, after all this happened with my son, I worked a few more years. I was consulting for a few more years, and then I was lucky uh, to be able to stop working and devote myself to this, you know, first promoting homeopathy and, and my writing and helping parents and stuff like that. So I'm lucky that I don't have to work. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, so, you know, being a writer. And I was going to say, so. that's a lot of work in itself. How yeah. do you see the concept of consciousness and conscious interaction with the field of consciousness affecting the future of us and of medicine? Hmm. Well... The reason why I wrote my book is just so that we could all evolve and become more conscious so that we could make better choices as a collective humanity. Like I said, our collective state of awareness is affecting machines even. It's affecting how things, um, how things transpire on the planet, and things now seem rather grim sometimes. I mean... But I don't think it's beyond possibility that even our consciousness can affect less things, and things like climate change. And there's a lot of work out there on the Internet, if you just look around, of people trying to do just that. Um, so uh, it's up to each one of us. We begin with each one of us. We begin with our own health, like you say. And there's a lot of books coming out now about, like Joe Dispenza's You Are the Placebo. I'm reading it right now. So basically, how... basically, are you saying that what we put out there into the world is what the field of consciousness is going to express, and so the buck stops here? It's our responsibility, what ends up out there. Exactly. Yes, of course. And, uh, you know, the more people take charge of what, what's going on in their own lives, and and really, you know, if, if you are a frequent meditator, you're going to get out more easily out of the state of fear <clears throat> that's permeating, you know, our society. That's like an important step. And yeah, be getting aware out of fear, of fear. Is, is huge, isn't it? Uh, so yeah. how, how long, just out of curiosity, how long after your son's diagnosis did you write your first book? Let's see. Well, he we realized he was sick in 1994. It came out in 2003. Got it. So, you know, yeah. it has been wonderful having you on the program, Amy. Thank you so much for spending time, and good luck on your path. 
Oh, thanks our, for having me. Our guest this hour has been the author of Active Consciousness, Awakening the Power Within, and Impossible Cure, The Promise of Homeopathy, Amy Lansky. Her website, amylansky.com. This has been the Science of Magic. For in-depth exploration of leading-edge subjects, join our email family at thescienceofmagic.net. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love as you embrace your power to transform. <laughs>